Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to the Jess Marshall Podcast. This week, I'm very excited. Um, I get the privilege to uh, sit down and chop it up with Dimitri Lipinski, Roofing Insights founder on YouTube and founder of Directory, which is changing the game with regard to construction lead generation. We're going to talk about everything from his upbringing to facing down adversity uh, to uh, to, to fighting back uh, when the haters come out of the woodwork. I'm very excited. I've been chasing Dimitri for six months, and he uh, he came to Dallas this week uh, to teach a class. And uh, I hope you enjoy this podcast, and I think you will. Thanks for coming on, man. I appreciate Absolutely. you. Hopefully those allergies are... Yes. Calm, a little calmer. I passed out yesterday at 7 o'clock. I came uh, to my room. I got Flonase. I got Benadryl. I think like three pills. And then I have my Citrusin. is another medicine I yeah. have. And I'm 6.30. I have a 7 o'clock call. And I text guys like, hey, if I don't call you, I'll call you in the morning. Uh, because I, I knew I'm gonna pass out. Yeah. I passed out. <laughs> woke up at midnight. I'm like, shit. Go back to sleep. Woke up three and work out. And I was up since three. That's awesome. What did you do? Your thousand burpees this morning? Um, similar. Close. Yeah. To, I did awesome. something different. Talk about that a little bit, because we're both we contractors. Going? Yeah. Okay. Um, we do. I like the cold open, just yeah. so every wow. so so everybody's good to go. We're both contractors, so we know like, hey, there's the uh, the very real you know, um, temptation to just grind, right? Like, uh, as soon as my eyes open, I'm sending emails, I'm calling, I'm posting on social media. And before I know it, it's 6 p.m. And I haven't gotten a workout in, I haven't meditated, I haven't read, I maybe haven't eaten, and uh, probably haven't spent very much time with my family either. And all of those things are very important. Was it, has it been a growing experience for you as you got into this business to try to balance every, cause I mean, you're busy, man. You're always mm -hmm. traveling, you're teaching, you're on the move all the time. What's that been like trying to develop balance or is it still a balancing act trying to get that balance? Uh, right now I have the best work-life balance of anyone you'll meet. Um, like my, I'm proud of my work-life balance. People who know me, who came to Minneapolis, visited my home. Um, like if you fly in, I have sauna in my garage. I have really? $20,000 gym. I have full CrossFit set up in my garage because I want to save time. The reason I did all of it, so, um, you know, Saturday, Sunday, or like in the middle of the week, if my wife wants to go out with girlfriends, like I and I, I want to work out. I'll put kids to sleep. I go there. So I, I've built my lifestyle around what matters to me. For me, it's fitness. For me, it's you know making videos. Like my wife went to Russia two years ago for like two weeks, and I literally have my videographer come into my basement and still filming videos. I don't stop. If I found something that works really well, like and you have to be consistent with it, like whether it's working out or making YouTube videos, you don't stop. You keep the main thing, the main thing and everything else is secondary. So for me, the main thing is I have to learn. I have to read every day. I have to teach because when you teach others, you actually learn yourself. It, it puts you in a different mindset. When you have to prepare for the class, it's just um, it's a preacher's effect. Why preachers and pastors are so good? Not because they're saints, but because they have to read more Bible. They have to preach more. And when you prepare that sermon, you're the first one who's going to hear it. So 40-minute sermon will take you eight hours. For me to teach for one day class like I'm teaching tomorrow, I have to spend a couple weeks on my presentations. Like my 30-minute presentation, it's eight hours worth of work. So you have to re-examine yourself, re-examine everything you do, and make sure you're right because people will call you out. It's like, oh, Dimitri, it's BS. It doesn't work anymore. So uh, right now I have the wor best work-life balance, uh, but first two years in the roofing business, I was suicidal. I almost took my life. I did not want part of it. I was successful, but I did not see trees um, uh, through the forest. Yeah. Uh, I was in it. I was working way too much. I was not exercising. I think I quit gym. I remember uh, in June 2015, I found myself like so broken, like uh, I have people stealing from me. I have uh, betrayal. And the reason even that happened, because 
I let it happen. I was juggling too many things. I was not paying attention, you know, what people are doing who under me. I was uh, too busy working and then literally almost cost me my business. I have mm. two sales guys left and started their own thing and trying to recruit my other people, just typical contractor stuff, right? And other employees were loyal. They told me about it, like typical stuff. But I remember what I felt that day. And I said, I made myself a promise that first and foremost, I always will take care of myself. No matter what, I will never, ever skip the gym. Like I never cancel membership again. And I rejoined and I said, this is this is too important. I found myself skinny, not healthy, bad uh, habits with the food, bad habits with the drinking, you know, like that. Uh, as a matter of fact, I was seven years sober before I started my roofing business. Six months into the business, I'm like, I need something. I need a beer. I need to calm down. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. I, I, I let beer in here and like, now I don't want to drink again. Like now, like when your life is in a perfect order, you don't need alcohol yeah. to be happy. But when you stress and out of balance, you need, you, you plugging in those holes with the wrong things sometimes. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, not drinking is amazing, um, especially down here. You know, it's so hot. Like if you if you try dr mixing drinking and working outside, it just uh, it's uh, like work. oil and water. Yeah, you're a man of faith as well, and that plays a big a big part in your life. I don't I don't like to talk about it because uh, I have so many. I'm not perfect, and I have so many things like. Uh, so you're human. It's not about that. Like, I, I don't want to call myself religious. Mm -hmm. I do believe in God and I do read Bible, but um, I, I don't talk to my employees about it. I don't want to discuss it in details. I do go to church. I, you know, I, I do my devotionals and stuff. But for me, your life, people should see you. And if they don't see it, what's the point of talking about it? So I just, I don't like to talk about yeah, it. Yeah, I, I get you, man. <laughs> I'm, I'm the same way. You, you talked about preachers. My, I grew up in the church my dad is a minister i see so i saw the process all the time getting the sermon ready practicing all of that and you're right when you do teach something you learn it differently than if you just read it or watch a youtube video or even just do it when you're actually teaching it to someone i find that i realize the things that i'm not doing with regard to that technique or that method that would make it more effective and then I improve on my end. And there's also a little bit of that, uh, man, I don't want to be a hypocrite, right? If I show my guys, like, this is how we're going to knock doors. This is how we're going to prospect. This is how we're going to network. This is how we're going to treat clients. Well, I sure as hell better be doing that myself, right? Communicating quickly, bringing value, being honest, action, mm -hmm. speaking louder than words, all of those things. So I like that a lot. What got you into the contracting and most namely the roofing business. Did you just wake up one day and go, I don't know, man, it's Minnesota, snow and ice. Let's get on some roofs, man. How did that happen? So I'm, uh, I moved to the United States in 2005. Uh, all my life, ever since I, I was a teenager, uh, when I started asking myself what I want to do, um, like in middle school and high school, I knew I wanted to be a teacher. It was just like my childhood uh, dream. So I wanted to be a teacher uh, after high school, went to become, uh, went to uh, college and be, uh, got my first degree, three years in college, became a teacher and went to university in Russia and uh, also for uh, uh, <clears throat> majoring in history, but to become a history of teacher, a uh, teacher of history. And uh, in university, I realized there's no future in Russia. I'm the oldest of seven kids. I will not be able to take care of my parents. Uh, just was disappointing uh, in the system. Like, um, like I looked around and everybody who graduated already, nobody even uh, teaching because uh, if you have major in university, you can become a police officer that pays like three times what teachers make. And mm. there's no country on earth that pays well teachers. No. Like you, you ask is no different. No country. Like uh, for me, to me is like the most honorable job on earth, like someone who taking care of next generation, right? But uh, as much as I wanted to teach, I realized as a man, I also have to support it for my family. I'm like, it's not going to work. And uh, I saw this opportunity to move to the United States. 
I'm like, okay, I'm going to try it. Like, what do I have to do? It's like, well, you have to learn English. And I did not speak one word. At the age of 20, I did not speak one word of English. Really? And I needed to to study English, to pass the interview, to go to uh, for uh, we have this program called U uh, uh, U.S. C uh, Cancellors USA. So it's uh, a student exchange program. You come to the United States for three months to work in a summer camp. Uh, every year back then, two thousand. Like as a camp counselor? Yeah, yeah, camp counselor, or I was a kitchen staff. Gotcha. So I was working in the kitchen in Wisconsin, actually. So they 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 find a camp for you. So I applied, and I had eight months to learn enough English to pass the interview. Wow, man! I remember every single day, and I'm grand. Like I'm a um, studying history, so it's freaking. Eight to five every day, full time student. You have to still do that and pick up uh, English on the side. And I did it, man. I was uh, most people who come to the United States by from that program. They their major is English. It's teachers of English, and they come here to practice English so they can teach English in Russian schools. And I was the only guy. <laughs> who went who was a historian so gotcha. I, i'm sitting like in all girls like i think it's like 95 percent uh g females and five percent men like guys always struggle with the foreign languages and stuff so i think i, I met like one other guy it was all girls and i was the only one wh whose major was not english i was it's like what are you doing here like want to go to the united states but before i even go i told everybody i told my parents i said i'm not coming back they give you a visa for four months and uh, after four months you're supposed to come back so it's a summer visa and i'm like i'm not coming back and people try to convince me no come back and finish your degree it's a five-year degree and I, so i have three years to go i'm like and then what what I'm going to do with the major in history, if I already know I'm not going to be a teacher, I, already, I, I got disappointed along the way. So I spent five years learning something and all education is good. I love my education. It helps me actually every day. It helps me with the YouTube because I learned how to learn. When you learn how to learn, you can do anything. Like roofing business is easy. Like <laughs> learning history was hard. Learning roofing business is easy. I have memory. I love books. I love reading. So long story short, I come to the United States in 2005. Um, before I left the country, I told my dad, I said, I'm not coming back. He's like, what are you going to do there? I said, dad, I'm going to become a millionaire. He's like, what? Yeah, I'm going to become a millionaire. And actually, I got my parents here five years ago. I moved my parents, my sister, and working for the rest of the families. Changed my family tree. But in 2005, when I came here, they put me in a camp in Wisconsin, three months camp, summer camp, uh, $1,500 for entire summer. Uh, so we got paid at the end of uh, August, and they provide you a bus to Chicago. Mm. One of those greyhounds. So we, we did not know shit about the United States. I did not know that everything in suburbs. I'm a Russian immigrant. In Russia, everything happens in downtown. You know, if you picture Russia, like five-story buildings, nine-story buildings, it's all big. It's all apartment complexes. There's no, like, private sector. There's no... People don't live in small houses in suburbia. You know, 80%, 90% of population is in the big city. So I'm like... I need to find a job. I need to downtown. So I found myself uh, with a, a three other Russian uh, students in downtown Chicago, literally knocking doors at all local restaurants looking for a job. And the reason local restaurants is because that's the only language that we could speak about prepping food because we work three months in a kitchen. So we're like, mm, we work three months in a kitchen. You kind of have a work history in it. You go to a restaurant. You know, maybe they'll take it. It was brutal, man. Uh, I ended up living uh, in a car for a month. I spent a lot of nights in the parks going, you know, using, uh, you know, public parks, restrooms when they were open. Later, they got closed. Uh, lake Zurich is very rich area in Chicago. They have like Lake Zurich is the name of the lake. At night, we would go there in September in uh, uh, Illinois to wash ourselves at night. Uh, learn a lot of tricks how to freaking survive. You go to Walmart and you buy the cheapest sausages. They're like dollar a pack, right? Like very cheap, but they're nasty. They're nothing good, like very watery. I'm like, fuck, like I can't eat it. But you only have like $3 a day to survive. You have no job. And uh, you, what you do is you, you, 
you gather sticks in a park and they have uh, little grills, like park grills. Right. And you cook them on the grill and it's different meat. The cheapest sausage actually tasty when you do it that way uh my first car we bought was 96 four towers did not make freaking 100 miles they sold me a lemon <laughs> did not make 100 miles so we're going on this job interview and literally did not make it we're going on the highway and the car goes from 80 to 70 to 60 bad transmission and bad engine no. so we took exit car at this point it doesn't even go in second gear so 20 miles an hour, 10, and <laughs> literally dies in front of old used car dealership. Like, shit. <laughs> so we get out. It's still four of us. Two guys go back to Russia, and me and my buddy, I convinced my friend. I said, let's stay here. Let's make it happen. He's like, I have no money. And I had, at, at first, I had 1500 I said, my money is your money. So I split it in half. It's like, don't worry about it. <laughs> but it went, went so fast. 700 bucks for the first car that did not make it. And then at that point, I, th I think I have like $500 left. I go it, uh, to that dealership and I found this Pontiac Transport 3.8 liter engine. It was old, like minivan, whatever, SUV, seven seater car. And they were selling for $1,150. I didn't have $1,150. So I negotiated the deal, gave the guy like 900 bucks, borrowed 500 bucks from another guy who going to Russia. I'm like, man. He was from my city. I said, I will wire you money. Give me like a month or two. And at that time, don't have a job. Don't have papers. My visa is about to expire. And I had a ticket back home. This program provides you a round trip ah. ticket. And you know what I did? I tore it into pieces. When I did not have a job, I Burn said. Burn the ships. Burn the ship. And I said, I'm not going back. I will die on the streets, but I'm not going back. And that car, we stayed in that car for a month. We, we lived in the car. Uh, my first job was uh, $6 an hour daily department and stayed there for six months. Within two months, I saved money to buy a Honda Civic for $2,000. It was, I was actually saving 1000 bucks a month. I was making two grand a month and I could save 1000 bucks. Not many people can do it today. No. I was doing with a six dollars an hour job. Three guys rented apartment for a thousand bucks. So my well, you didn't need water in your apartment. You just go down to the lake, right? Well, we, <laughs> I, I could eat in the store because it was deli department. Uh, yeah, At the end of the day, you, you, you could have a rotisserie chicken that you didn't sell the rice. Instead of throwing it away, we could actually Boom. take it home. Uh, but I told my manager, I said, I'll work here. They needed a guy to close the store to mop the floors because all the ladies who was working in Delhi, they did not want to do it. And like, dude, I'll do it, but I cannot work eight hour shifts. What I'm going to do two to 10? I have to, I was the only guy in a store who worked 12 to 10, like 10 hour shifts every day. And they were paying o um, overtime. So I was uh, getting... 70 hours a week with the overtime. I was getting a little bit over 2000 It was a huge amount of money for me. It was so good, man. For six months, I stayed there. And then I found a childhood friend in Minnesota uh, who was doing siding. And uh, like uh, through my mom, through Siberia, I'm like, mom, there was a family 10 years ago. I knew that guy because we spent some summers together. I said, I know he's in the United States. Find me his number. Found the number. Call him. Alex, what do you know, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, come to Minnesota. Moved to Minnesota. He was a siding installer, subcontractor for builders. And he hired me, gave me 10 bucks an hour. I actually was making less money uh, on a $10 an hour siding job than a $6 um, deli department job. I could save less. I actually, at that point, making six bucks, I could save 1000 bucks a month. Now I'm in Minnesota. I don't have roommates. It's just me. 700 bucks apartment. I barely making two grand. If it rains, we don't work. If it's if materials not there, you don't work. Very fresh that I learned that I, I became freaking poor. Now 2000 is barely enough. I buy all my food. It was brutal and I, I couldn't save anymore. So like a lot of people count their money by what they make. It's true. It's true. It's not what you make. It's what you save. And then um, I met my future wife while I was in Minnesota. Now I have five kids. I have five businesses and the rest is history. The rest is history. <laughs> Here we are. Wow, that's amazing, man. I, uh, I, I like to talk to people about living a fearless life and about embracing adversity. These are things that seem like they came pretty naturally to you. Is that part of your upbringing? Were, were your parents just grinders? Or is this just something that in you, there's this deep down, there's this fire, this competitive fire that, that you're going to 
you're going to put your mind to something and it doesn't matter what gets in your way you're getting you're you're going to you're going to reach that objective i always say give credit where it belongs i'm just grateful for what i have um i grew up in siberia I grew up very poor uh, seven kids one bedroom apartment i was the poorest kid out of all my friends like being in Siberia is one thing, being poor is another thing, but when you're the poorest in any community, it sucks. Uh, I grew up not only poor because everybody around me were poor, but I also was the poorest kid, you know, among all. But then something changed. My dad, um, he was entrepreneur. He, he was in trucking business. Uh, when USSR collapsed in 91, government let people open, uh, they called corporations, um, small businesses. My dad bought a truck and started working. He was a subcontractor for big oil companies. Got like 20 guys under him, was building bridges, uh, moving sand, snow, whatever. Like he was entrepreneur. The problem was uh, in Russia, it's very common when entrepreneurs don't get paid for a long time. Like, you know, my dad sometimes would not get paid for a year or two. Like imagine like you build a bridge for a big company and you're not getting paid and it's just tomorrow's tomorrow's like there's a lot of shadiness happening here where contractors or companies file bankruptcy and don't pay their bills well in russia it's 10x that like people go start a company you know do the work get paid then bankrupt the company and they'll never see the jail time for six years. it's just a lot of bullshit but my dad been doing a lot of that and uh i remember like when i was in sixth grade i was um collecting beer bottles like you go on the street russians are at least used to be 20 years ago they're very dirty like uh, streets were full of garbage right like nobody picks up anything and but it was um <clears throat> it was uh, amazing opportunity for me as a kid a lot of homeless people do it you collect those bottles and you uh, exchange them for money 10 bottles equals one bread. I remember it was like 70 cents and bread was like seven, not dollars, but rubles. And uh, I remember as a kid, like we did not have money and my dad always was working somewhere and my mom raising us. And I would like during the day and at night, I would go to all garbage place. I knew all the homeless people in my town because I was competing with them. After school, I would just get my backpack and collect uh, those beer bottles. I remember I bought my sister a hat, like winter hat for 25 rubles. Because, you know, like you take those um, bottles home, you, you have to wash them from uh, stickers. Uh, they wouldn't accept it otherwise. So it was good money-making gig in a sense, but you have to do it at night. You still, you know, you don't want your friends to know that <laughs> you're doing what homeless people are doing. Um, but growing up poor, I remember, I, like, it was my fear. I was asking myself, um, are you going to end up? It was my fear inside out. If I'm going to grow grow up and <clears throat> end up poor like that because I didn't want to. You're good, man. It's all good, brother. Man, I haven't been there in a long time in that place. Yeah. Anyway, so it was it was a hard place to be because you see this life and you don't know how to get out. And yeah. you see your dad is trying to to, to make it it was hard for my dad to support. And I was asking myself, like I was dreaming, like, I don't want to be this guy. But funny enough, a around the same time, I was a big Jordan fan. Yeah. So me and my best buddy, we were playing basketball. I was the smallest kid in town in uh, in class. I have only one girl in my class who was shorter than me. So not only all the boys were oh, no. taller, but also all the girls. But I love freaking basketball. And at the same time, I was watching NBA games. It was uh, Chicago Bulls seasons. Michael Jordan was the champion. I have a cheap Chinese shirts with Michael Jordan on it. I play basketball like crazy. Uh, I mean, we would, I would beat everybody. Like I was a good shooter. It was my sport. And I was dreaming to go to the United States and freaking play an NBA. As crazy as it sounds, but after school, you picking up these beer bottles 
to freaking buy you clothes and food. But during the school, you have this dream to go to the United States and play NBA. Kind of two things. Like, that's how dreams are born in us. So you don't want to be poor, but you don't know how to get there. So you're dreaming while you're doing what you can. And and I think that's what later in life, in college and stuff, when I saw this opportunity that I, <clears throat> that I can change something, I did. Yeah. And I never looked back. Man, that's fucking awesome. I mean, it's uh, it's very, very inspiring because um, it's very popular now to 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 blame everyone around you for your own failings, right? It's just this. It's it's more way more of a pandemic than the pandemic that we've been going through. Is this victim mentality of? Hey, somebody sees you, you're successful, and they say something like, man, that must be nice. Like like that you just woke up one day and it was mm-hmm. all right outside your front door. Overnight success. Right. And um, you find, I find, a real kinship when I meet people who are like, man, I've been, I've been through it. I'm not going to dwell on that, but I've been through it. Mm-hmm. And you can tell when someone's been through it, when, and when they never gave up, maybe there were times when you're like, hey, maybe I want to give up because I think that goes through every entrepreneur's mind here and there, maybe on on a daily basis because mm-hmm. things are coming at you fast. <sighs> but I never gave up and I'm never going to give up. That's not an option. I'm tearing up my ticket. That's fucking badass. Mm-hmm. It would have been cool if you'd save, save that and frame <laughs> that, man, that torn up ticket. Um, it, would, it would be my temptation. What if you would be tempted to actually go back because you have it? Yeah, yeah. The the um, you didn't really have growing up. You were in survival mode, mm-hmm. and around here, people aren't in survival mode as much. So it's just everybody's comfortable, or yeah. many many people is comfortable. Yes. not everybody, but and it's uh, I look at social media, and uh, you know, it's just uh, it's refreshing. When you talk to people who um, share kind of the same core values of I it hell and high water, bring them on because mm-hmm. I'm going to get through them. It doesn't matter. I'm I'm going to go until the wheels fall off. My wife asks me all the time, uh, like I I don't know where I got it from, but I never look back. Once I move on, I never look back. And there's so many people in this world, like my parents are, like the entire generation. They want to hold on to things. I don't understand why for me do the garage sale like freaking sell everything move on like I moved so uh, back to my story I moved to Minneapolis and then I have just another friend uh, invited me to Atlanta said come to Atlanta live with me uh, he was actually a videographer he flew to Minnesota to film the wedding and I met him at the Russian Baptist Church and uh, he said what are you doing here I'm like you know what I actually don't know what I'm doing here. Like, I don't have a lot of friends. He's like, come to Atlanta. You can uh, live in my house. I'm single, but he was living with the parents at that age. We were like early 20s. And I'm like, sure. So I flew uh, to Atlanta on Saturday, got a job interview on Monday in a cabinet shop. And I ended up working over a year in that cabinet shop. And I loved it. I loved Atlanta. It was completely different. And but I already met my future wife, so I was keep flying back. Mm. We were like distance relationship, so I flew back a few times to Minneapolis. Within a year, I proposed to my future wife. She said yes, and we started planning wedding. So I within two years we got married in Minneapolis. It was 2007. I flew back her to Atlanta, and um, within five years we have like four kids. I don't know. Just I changed a lot of jobs, but um, the cabinet shop job, I was working for a Russian company. And after a year, I realized I'm not developing, I'm not growing. Like, you know, we have Mexicans and Russians, you know, working in the shop building cabinets. I grew like, you know, I was making, uh, I don't know, at the end, 1375 an hour. And I remember I have a talk with the owner. I said, what's my future here? And he said, uh, I can give you 75 cents raise every six months. And it was decent. It was fair. But I did my math. I'm like, it'll take me five years to get tw- to $25. And my wife was pregnant at the time. I'm like, I can't support. Like, I did not want my wife to be working. And she was working in a bank at the time right before uh, 
uh, our first child was born, she was um, um, working um, in a bank, making 15 bucks an hour. I was making 13.75 at the highest, so probably even less at the time. I'm like, I can't do that. Yeah. And I started looking for a different job just for that reason, because I did not see fast enough grow. Like I was that aggressive. I want to support the family. And I, I came home one day. I said, baby, I want to find American company where nobody speaks Russian because I want to speak how they speak. It was my goal. And sure enough, through a friend of the friend, I found this uh, American remodeler in downtown Atlanta uh, who was looking for help. I was the only immigrant. And uh, I stayed there for two years. Uh, he bankrupted his company. And after two years, I had more tools than the guy had. But I learned so much. It was it was actually true um, immigrant school. Like, I'm so grateful. His name is Josh, wife Michelle. I love that family so much. They went through hell, typical contractor story. Uh, in 2009, when everything collapsed, he was suffering. Uh, we had really big projects, like $150,000 floor addition like we would remove the roof at the floor put the f- a roof back on you know fifty thousand dollar basement finishing seventy five thousand kitchen remodels additions like i was doing it all and uh, but um it was 45 minute drive to work 45 miles and usually 45 in the morning through atlanta traffic at the end like about an hour so twice a day almost for an hour i had to listen to the radio and he was a rush limbo fan uh, like all the conservative radio. So I, I would show up 645 for two years and we would talk politics. Yeah. Obama was coming into office. He's like, I hate that guy. It was all Obama versus like Hillary Clinton. It was good for me because I'm an immigrant. And he, he was asking me about Russia and Putin. And I was asking him about what's going on in this country. So in two years, honestly, it was the best English school you, you, could, That's you awesome. could get. Dave Ramsey, all this conservative talk go. shows like Fox News, Hannity, like, uh, and you have a passionate boss about it. So he, I learned a lot of things, but also what not to do. This guy was on drugs, and then I barely started seeing him, and he literally bankrupted his company, and then he could not pay me. And I came home and said, babe, I will never work for anyone else, and I never did. And I started my flooring company, ended up selling it two years later. It was my first business, and um, it was very successful business. Uh, I was running like five, six crews at the end, but my mother-in-law in Minnesota got cancer. And when she got cancer, they used to come to Atlanta to visit us. We didn't have any immediate family in Atlanta. And I remember we were th- just um, heartbroken what's happening. She was going through chemotherapy, like the closest person on earth um, at the time. I didn't have my parents here. She had her parents and her mom is going through chemotherapy, losing her hair, going through surgeries. And I'm like, what's now? And I came home one day. I said, babe, let's move back to Minneapolis. She's like, what are you going to do there? I'm like, what I'm doing here? I'm a contractor. I'll figure it out. No. And uh, I remember my biggest account uh, in Atlanta was a company who were flipping homes. We were doing like 25 homes a week. Freddie Mac, Fannie Mac houses. I came to them and said, guys, probably going to move to Minneapolis. Like, we can't lose you. Like, you're your <laughs> you're asset to us. And uh, can we buy your company? We buy your company. You train your replacement. And then you can go. I'm like, deal. We rented a warehouse. They bought my company. I worked for them. We agreed for a year, but in eight months, I set up QuickBooks. I set up replacement. I mean, we were doing 25 houses per week. I was doing carpet in every single one of them. I was buying truckloads of carpet, 38 rolls at a time from Dalton, Georgia, capital. I mean, floors, tile, everything. I have 350 pallets of tiles on the shelves. I have two forklifts. I mean, full operation. And I found a replacement, built it, and sold it. Still best friends with those guys in Atlanta. But when I was moving to Minneapolis, my fourth child was just born. Sophia was one month. And I remember before I decided to move back, I started thinking, am I going to do a flooring business there? And I have my friend who is a siding installer and I have big Russian community and I did not know anyone who was doing floors. Everybody I knew, like siders, cider, roofers, framers, whatever. So I did this little search and this is what I recommend to everyone. Before you make any decision, just ask everyone around it about your options. I called every general contractor I knew, every roofer, every siding guy. 
And I remember calling my buddies uh, who I used to work with, like, hey, Alex, if you would open business today, what would you do? He's like, I would open a roofing company. Mm. I called my G- GC guys, like, what would you do? Like, roofing. You will not find one general contractor in this country who will turn down a roofing job. Yeah, no doubt. <laughs> Everybody in the contracting world wants to be a roofer. Yes. It's deep inside. They don't know shit about it. Yeah. But nobody will turn out a roofing job. This is true. It's easy. Yeah. And like, there's something to it. And I started digging a little bit more, uh, looking at the competition. There's a few things I did not, not like about flooring business. You're inside the houses. You need access. It's very, like, if you do it yourself, great. But when you have employees, like, uh, the, here's how easy roofers have it. You know how many times I did a, later in the business, I did a final walk with a homeowner. When we both look at a roof on a driveway and say, hey, how does it look to you? He's like... You tell me, it looks good to me. I'm like, really? And and he pays you like 10 grand. You know how it is to do the walk on a freaking flooring yeah, job? Picking everything, man. They, they go <laughs> in. Like I have a contract in my flooring business that if you cannot see it within three feet, it's not considered to be a damage. Like you walking on the floors, if you cannot see it within three feet, don't even look. You cannot be on your fours looking at a gap and saying fix it in the middle of the floor. Yeah. How am I supposed to fix it? Right. You just went on high heels and make the dent. It's irreplaceable. Yeah. So um, people can be very unreasonable. You have a furniture. You have like a lot of moving parts, a lot of liability in the flooring business. When I was doing it myself, did not have a problem. When I start hiring employees, you have more – and when I started looking at the roofing, I'm like, well, people don't have to be home. They don't go on a roof. Nope. It's almost identical with the trade, like, you know, staggering shingles. It's almost as just as for staggering flooring. It's similar trade, you know, different fasteners, different materials, but still bundles there, bundles here. So as far as trade goes, it's very similar. I'm like, I'll just open a roofing business because that's not where the money is. Demand is there. I'm starting from scratch anyway. I have no advantage from coming from Atlanta to Minneapolis because nobody knows me there anyway. I, it's not like I have clientele or any accounts. And I started a roofing business with no knowledge of roofing business. And I did $900,000 in sales for the first year, uh, which is only 10 roofs. Uh, for the first year, I did I, I paid $1099, $350,000 to my gutter guy. And the reason is it took me... So I moved in March. Uh, I only got my license in June. So the, for the first three, four months, the only thing I could do was gutters because mm. it's not the required permits. Mm-hmm. I'm like, okay, that's the only thing I can do. I'll do it. So I started advertising gutters. But later I, I built, I was doing eight, nine gutter estimates per day. And none of my business cards or um, a fridge magnets had the gutters on it. So I said, here's was my mentality said, I'm going to do as many gutter jobs as possible, and every client will get a magnet that says Storm Group Roofing and Siding. I want to be as as many uh, fridges as I possibly can be, and they're already my customers. So sooner or later, they'll call call me back. It Mm -hmm. freaking worked. So for the first six months, I've done hundreds and hundreds of gutter jobs, gutter replacements, uh, gutter covers, all of those. And people, my first referral started coming in. I need a roof because Magnet does not even sell gutters. Yeah. I did not brand myself as a gutter company, but nobody wanted to do gutters. So it was easy um, foot in the door. Job How were for- you rustling those gutter jobs up? Were you putting ads in the yellow pages or were you going door knocking? Um, or uh, Craigslist and Angels List. Yeah, there you go. Angels List. Uh, I built my business in 2013 on the back of Angels List. Angels List, now owned by your buddies yeah. at Home Advisor. Yeah. And uh, first thing what they did after they purchased it, they kicked me and all of my businesses from it. Really? So when I joined Angels List, I looked at the number one $50 million company had 242 reviews and angels i made it freaking my goal to beat them by reviews and angels list because it was working it took me exactly two years two years later i had 360 they have 340 so i beat the biggest player in town i was killing it and i ended up with over 700 reviews on angels list but i always hated on home advisor for their practices so i have this videos out there and videos were like phone calls. It wasn't even my first videos about Home Advisor was not about Home Advisor. My very first video was everybody was talking trash about Home Advisor. I'm like, you know what? The way I do marketing is I go all in. 
I listen, I learn, and I do everything platform wants me to do. Like, for example, house.com with double Z. I yeah. have 22 reviews on house. I have 16 albums because if I'm paying platform 350 a month that they ask you, I'm like, what do you want me to do? Do this, this, and I go really, you want me reviews? Okay, 22 reviews in the first 30 days I did on house. And then I keep paying $350, not a single job. So yeah. I, I know it doesn't work. I'm going to cancel it, yeah. but at least I did what I supposed to. Same experience with house, man. Yep. I had the exact same experience. But I did the same with the home advisor. So I'm like, okay, home advisor, what do you want me to do? So I spent like two grand and we did the whole thing. I called every single number within a couple minutes. Like, you know the spiel. Just like everybody else will say, you call 10 people, you only will talk to two, maybe three, bogusly stuff. So it did not work out. So I asked for a refund. There's no, and when I asked for a refund, I recorded a phone call with the, the reason why they're not refunding me. And I actually listed my uh, accounts and, uh, and numbers they gave me. Like, this is bogus. This guy said he never gave you number. Like, why are you charging me? One lead was $122. Is it a roofing lead? Uh, siding lead. Siding? 122 And it says exact match. Right. And I actually got a hold of Those final. Those were more expensive. Yes. Yeah. So I was asking for refunds and I recorded a phone call and I uploaded to YouTube and Home Advisor VP like reached out, say, I'll give you $1,000 if you remove this video, but you have to sign a form. <laughs> I'm like, like uh, uh, how, you won't come after us ever again type of form? Yeah, like pretty much release that you will never make a video or gotcha. something like that. I'm like... Nope, not when gonna... you posted that video. How many subscribers did you have at that point? Oh, like 2,000. It was actually Storm Group Roofing, it wasn't even Roofing Insights, really. Yep, and uh, and then funny things happened. So they purchased um, Angels List, I believe, in July mm -hmm. and in August. So I'm paying at this time, I'm paying Angels List 3,500 bucks a month. And the contract that you sign with Angels List is for the first page showing, first page, yes. right? So I'm on the first page. And then in August, my busiest month, calls drop. I'm like, what is happening? So I go to Angels List. I'm on the second page. I'm like, why am I in the, on the second page? So I called Angels List. And they're like, you actually cannot advertise with us. I'm like, why? You have to talk to legal. And this is two months after Home Advisor purchased them. And I'm paying you 3500 bucks a month. I'm like, I'm not paying you no more. And for for one, for two, but they're also, they downgraded me to B, which is, I was A plus for all the years. And now they downgraded me to B. They moved me to the second page. And I did, I did another video analysis of me and my biggest competitor. I had more A reviews, less G reviews. They were A plus and I was B. Like, uh, like I'm a math guy. Like, did not like, make no sense. And I actually put it on YouTube. I mean, guys, you tell me, how I have uh, way more A reviews and w uh, half Gs that they have, and they were rating higher, we and we both were paying. And uh, and then later they actually, so I have another business, Ice Dam Removal Business, yeah. a seasonal business, four or five uh, reviews on Angels List, all five stars, could not advertise that. I cannot advertise any of my businesses with Angels List, right? I'm like, this is messed up. And it's like, talk to legal, talk to legal. But legal would not talk to you. You send them letters, you send them emails. I'm like, screw it, I'm out. I, I, I don't need you. And it used to be 90% of my business. Yeah. So I, I, I had to do what worked there elsewhere. Good thing was I was spending money. So when you have 3,500 bucks a month to spend, you can give it to Google, you can give it to Facebook, you know, plus you already have your brand. So my company, like we never went down in sales. So every year we kept growing and I never door knocked. So I figured out marketing. But when I left Angels List, here's the saddest part. I have 717 reviews on Angels List. I only have 17 on Google. Yeah. That's why I tell everyone, Google is the king. It's a trillion dollar company, what's not, like 800 billion, whatever. They're not going anywhere. Nope. Home advisors come and go, Angels List come and go, Yelps comes and go. Yeah. Google is to stay. I mean, now we have 170 reviews. Mm -hmm. Once you know how to get reviews and stuff, you can grow. But what would happen to my brand if I would have 700 Google reviews? It's a different story. What uh, What does a contractor, what's the best way for a contractor to get a positive review? Because a lot of times positive experiences do not result in just a volitional choice on behalf of the client to post a positive review. Yeah. Usually... 
what we do is come in, do the final walkthrough, get a certificate of satisfaction signed. Hey, any punch list items? And then, hey, would you mind <laughs> writing me re a review? This I have all my guys and gals a review with my name in it on Google and on Nextdoor. Sure. And a lot of times people will will just do that, especially if you, if, hey, if I write this out for you, will you just copy and paste it and maybe add a little flair if you like? What? How, you, I, how I, did you I go about that? I don't know if I like that. I don't you don't know like I, that? Uh, writing reviews for you, no. It has to be authentic. I mean, couple tips. I just give them an outline, though. Sure. Right? Showed up on time, communicated, and didn't fuck us over. Here's the thing. <laughs> if, if you were impressive overall, like, First thing, like you have to be impressive. Like your customer service have to be on point. Uh, you're right. You like if it's fair. They say if people don't like the service they get, they will tell twenty people ten times the, more. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So mm -hmm. if if they like you, they will tell three people. If they don't like it, they will tell twenty. Oh. And you don't have to ask for a bad review. It's coming your way. And, and this is what I teach contractors all the time. And actually, I'll be teaching tomorrow. You don't have to ask for better review. It's coming your way. Just know it. Like, but the problem is, if you only have five reviews on Google and you receive two one-star reviews, boom! Now you're a three-star contractor. Yeah. Now, if you have one hundred reviews and you have two reviews, now you're still four point eight, four point nine. Um, and that's what people don't understand. They don't have a strategy to get good reviews and then better reviews come. I have a contractor right now in directory that uh, we actually removed brand new contractor. Well, not brand new. He's been in business for a year or so, but on Google, he received, so we list him as a recommended contractor by directory. And within the last two weeks, he received two one-star reviews. Two one-star reviews and, two, and happened to be his first reviews. He, and the reviews are not that bad, just being late or give down payment, didn't start the job, like communication stuff. It's not like he stole money, ran away. But review service now, he's one-star contractor in Google. Mm -hmm. Now you have to go. I used to beg for, like, my phone would stop ringing if I would get one-star review on Angel's List back in the day because top reviews are always yes. at the top. Yes. And if we have a slow day, I mean, I would get like 20, 25 appointments a day and then, nothing happening. I'm like, do we have better review? Sure, go in and there is better review on top. And I would just get busy, get five good reviews to bury it so it's not even mm -hmm. a top five. So here's what you do. Number one, you're very personal with every client. When you write them um, email requests, I, I always like, thank you for choosing us. Like, don't be afraid to brag about yourself a little bit and don't be afraid to, to beg for a review. Say, hey, as a contractor, you know, it's... Um, we depend on good reviews. And I, I would say in, in the email, oftentimes when uh, we get a bad reviews, even if it's communication issues, but we don't get good reviews, even when we, when we do excellent work, we appreciate the review. So if you do really well, you will get them. Now, uh, I don't recommend bribing homeowners. Never, ever offer money. A lot you, of guys do that. It's a, it's the worst mistake. You can get. Google will ban you. Facebook will ban you. Mm -hmm. And... The worst thing that can actually happen, uh, if people mention it in a review itself, it's like, hey, they offer me fifty dollars to review. Uh, now it's the, and Google monitors it, right? Yes. Yeah. It, it does, now you just killed the rest of them. Maybe the rest of them were legit, but if you have one review yeah, mentions that. that you do fifty dollars, yeah. people will not trust the rest of it because you're bribing them, and there is no reason for it. Like, listen, you need to understand consumer behavior when we. Um, what tr truck do you, do you drive? Chevrolet. Do you like it? Yes. Do you recommend it? If I do Facebook post tomorrow and say, hey, what trucks would you recommend? What would you say? Yeah, Chevy Diesel. What a roofer or concrete guy would you recommend? People will always recommend their guy. Yeah. There's something in us that we want to recommend. I don't know, like uh, something in me wakes up, like uh, this passionate Dmitry who wants all their friends to drive good cars. Uh, to find good contractors like, you know, iPhone or Android. If you iPhone guy, you promote that. Do they pay you? Do Chevy pay you? No. no. But you like Maybe the... someday. <laughs> Maybe someday. <laughs> but the same thing here. When you do right. good... People it's know... Good point. People know it's hard to find a good contractor. If you're a good contractor uh, with amazing story, I know a lot of people recommended me. Being different is good. It, 
Make them remember you, not only for being a good contractor, but being different. Maybe you're immigrant like myself. Maybe like that diversity. Bring it in. I don't. That's want a Rodney to... Webb thing too, isn't it? Right. Um, like let's really. Hey, I'm I'm different. I speak different. I look different. And Embr- I, embrace. And the I'm going to embrace it. Not Absolutely. be embarrassed. Of be- it. Because pe- people will remember you for that. Don't don't try to be remembered just as a contractor. Like. People remember me as a CrossFit guy, maybe as a Russian roofer, wherever. wherever. You're on box jumps, man. <laughs> What's your vertical at right now? Forty something? What was that one you posted the other day? Close to forty-eight. It's crazy. Forty-seven bro. and a half. It's crazy. But it, it can be basketball. It can be, you can be a guitar player. Sure. If you connect with a homeowner on different level, people will remember. It it drives me nuts when you ask a homeowner who did their roof last time and they can't remember. They it happens remember. all the time. It does. So, and another reason to get the review, because it's a digital connection. We remember people who you can actually go and find right now all the reviews that you have written over the years to all the companies. You might not remember the company. One of the reasons you should be asking for it, because people will remember who they reviewed. Yeah, it forges it in their mind when they write out. But hey. you can, but you can actually see it if you have the same Gmail, yeah. which many people do. People go in like your reviews. You will see all, like all the all companies that, them, yeah. that that you've ever reviewed, and it can be on no more than a hundred. Yeah. But you're, if I ask you who did you hire, you either will remember something special about a contractor or who did you write a contract with, and like it, or a road review to. Another tip I would give, don't ask uh, people to give you Google reviews who don't have a Gmail. That's a secret of the trade. So if they have a Yahoo account or um, a Comcast, you're wasting your time. Nobody Should gonna... you ask them to get a Gmail account? No. Nobody no. going to do it. Y- yeah. You're telling me they're going to go and create Gmail account just to leave you a review? Maybe if you were that memorable, no, they would. No. Come on, No, bro. no. What, what you do is you have a two platforms. Like mm-hmm. I always send them, if they have Yahoo, Comcast, or anything else, I send them requests to re- review me on Better Business Bureau because mm-hmm. I, I, it's actually important to me. And for the rest of them, uh, for Gmail, it's always Google. For every other email, and you have them. They gave you email to communicate to them, so you see that in my CRM, you can see what is what was the email where you send the estimate sure, invoice. Sure. So if it's not Gmail, listen, you can if if you have one hundred emails with Yahoo and you said one hundred review requests, I'm telling you, you're getting zero. Zero. <laughs> zero. Because the people are not gonna go extra mile. Would yeah. you go extra mile to create a freaking Yahoo email? Probably not. <laughs> exactly. Probably not. Um, I I want to get to the BBB in in a minute um, because I know you're you've posted a couple of things about some of the uh, shady stuff that mm-hmm. they do, um, but you have I wouldn't say made a name for yourself, but to a degree you have uh, putting uh, bad lead gen people mm-hmm. on on blast on Front Street. So Home Advisors won, but there's these other guys who. They reach out to contractors, and that's it, it's like crack cocaine to a to a contractor when someone says, "Hey, I can get you hot leads." This is the buzzword right now: scheduled, yeah. scheduled appointments, yes. right? And um, and you ask, start asking them like, "Okay, so how are you going to do that?" Well, we can, we we tell a market we call, and I'm like, "Okay, so there's a huge do not call list mm-hmm. that results in." And there's one guy we both mutually know did this for me. Guy was waiting in his driveway for my rep. My rep shows up, good dude, um, rugby guy, you know, friend, college friend of my brother who's one of my GMs. Kid guy shows up. It's like his fourth appointment he's ever run. And the dude serves him with papers in his driveway for violating the do not call. Wow. And this kid's like, oh, Jess, what, like, what's going on? I said, you know, I don't know. We're going to figure it out. Um, but the, the, this guy extorted He's like, you, you got to pay me 2K or I'm going to sue you for 10K. Yep. And, and we worked it out. What started this uh, this this thing on the lead gen guys pinpointing the bad ones? And then also you've put guys who rip off crews because that fucking pisses me off too. You you hire a crew. They have families to feed. Then you invent some reason not to pay them. It's just garbage. But on the lead gen guys, sure. especially um, – 
I think there's a guy with the with the last name that starts with Wax. That's wax got, man. Yeah, that's got Don't a bad. Don't get it waxed. Yeah. Well, I just. Um, Did you make those t-shirts? Is, are those your yeah, t-shirts? Yeah. Don't you, get you, waxed. You, you, you can buy it off our YouTube channel. Uh, so the thing about that is, once you build an audience, I, I'm a fighter, but I want to fight the good fight. Like you have, uh, like when I see something very unfair, like I work hard for my money. For me. Everything has a number and everything is calculated. What people don't understand is the $2,000 you just get scammed. Like to work for $2,000 in the roofing industry, that's $20,000 worth of work. You have to sell $20,000 worth of work to make $2,000 yes. profit. And it drives me crazy where the roofers write off it as a loss. Okay, I learned my lesson never again. I'm like, no, you did not learn a lesson. What, what actually happening is we're contributing to the, um, to the problem. And I could not stand when contractors did not talk about it. I wanted to be not only consumer advocates, but I wanted to get down to the problem. I want to find out what works and what doesn't work. And if it doesn't work, I want to spread information as much as what works. So I'm teaching people what works, but I also want to tell them, hey, be careful. Because those bad players, they ruin the market for good players too. For example, let's say you have a call center and you have a good call center. Let's say you follow all the rules, do not call list, everything, right? But you're one of 10 who do it right, just like roofers do. Yeah. Like not everybody waves deductible. So, so now if I try two call centers and I have similar problems like yours, I will never try another call center, no matter how good they are. But I'm Dmitri, might have different experience. So what I want to do is like, hey, man, my call center is good. You will never have a problem. Here's my guarantee. So what I would start doing, I started really highlighting the good services. And I started, I declare war on everything that is nasty, dirty. And I said, you know what? We have to clean up this industry. Like that Joshua Waxman guy, uh, I actually interview him. There's people always say like, Dimitri, you're hating. There's no hate. There's so much I've, love. I've watched that There's interview. so much love in it. Yeah. Like I love Joshua Waxman. I want him to change. But you need to understand that he took money from 150 contractors. And that list could be, if not for me, it could be 500, maybe 1,000. And it's the same story. I'm not looking for drama, for conflict. I'm looking for pattern. When that pattern is happening, someone have to stop. My favorite uh, uh, reality TV show, it's actually American Greed. I love studying big it's scams. An awesome. awesome show. Beautifully the done. The wine one. Have you all, seen the all, wine yeah, one? Yeah, all, it's just all of like, them. But if, like, ask yourself what, what's happening in the brain of the criminal and what needs to happen for them to stop. I actually study it, like legitimately study. I read the papers. I study serial killers, like their histories. I study, uh, you know, big scams with money, uh, money laundering. If you study them, you see the pattern and they need to be stopped. They need The only way to stop a scammer is to expose him. It's not to sue him. It's not to try to deal with him one-on-one. -on -one. He's publicly selling his stuff and you need to publicly stop him. You need to expose him. Nothing else will work. And it, in a social media world, it's so easy. Like Joshua Waxman, he'll go to one group, scam 10 contractors, they blast him, kick him out. He'll go to another group. There is like 20 roofing groups right now. And then he might change the industry. So I asked him a question. I said, Joshua, how many contractors did you take money from? He's like, 150. I'm like, let's do a deal. Give me three testimonials. Three. I'll call them. If we'll record every single call, if you can give me three happy clients, I will not, we'll stop it right here. I will not do video or anything. It stops. At that time, we only did one post. I was just gathering information, said, hey, a lot of people reached out to us that Joshua Wexman took money and ran away. If you have a story, reach out. And he, we were friends on the Facebook. He reached out like, hey, what's going on? Why are you digging? And like, I, I just want to find out. So he took five days, gave me two names, never gave me even a third name. I called both names. Both said they would not hire him again. One guy got one job out of 10 leads and was happy about it. And the reason why he was happy because it was $70,000 job. He just literally got lucky. He said, I paid him like 2,500 bucks. 
uh, most of them were like fake, blah, blah, whatever. But it was one job that actually churned and that $70,000 project actually paid for itself. And within six months, he got a result. And because he got a result, he could. But, uh, and I asked him, I said, would you do it again? He's like, nope. Even the guy who got one job out of it could, would, would not go through experience. And that was telling me the story. And the other guy, the same thing. He said, well, technically he gave me some leads, but he but we went in the winter. He was actually in Minnesota. So we still have a credit with him. He said he'll do it in the spring. I'm like, come on, man. <laughs> no. you, you know, you, you, no, you're no, this no. happy client. He already. And if you do the math, $2,500 average ticket. 150 contractors, and you cannot even name three that are happy. That's why I did the video. That's why I called him out. And recently, we have a, I have a mutual friend. Uh, you know, he he's um, Joshua Waxman. Literally walked to court the other day. In uh, he doesn't have a car. He walked to court over his custody over his kids. Uh, he doesn't pay child support. Uh, I mean, he's a drug addict. You can see it. You can see in the videos. He, the guy has issues. Now, I, I want to help the guy. That's my advice in the video was, Josh, get a job. You're a good sales rep. You can do a lot yeah, of good. Go through. sell roofs, man. Go, go sell roofs. Yeah. You can make 100K with your talent. Sure. You can make six figures working for someone. You cannot be trusted with money. And I've seen it with my. And how many of those 150 contractors would do what I did? Nobody wants to have a conflict, people afraid of controversy, people afraid of- well, Most contractors don't have the time either, right? Because they just lost $2,500. They're going to go earn it back somewhere else. I got to go hustle five mm -hmm. times harder to go earn back what I just lost from this guy. And yeah, he's but it's, bad, but it's but also time it's a, it's a victim mentality. It's the same thing happening to girls who have been raped. They don't want to talk about it. They don't, there's embarrassment. They, they don't want to come out. That's why we, we often say, well- You've been raped 10 years ago. Why are you talking about it now? Because it's not easy. And for the contractors, it's not easy to go in and say, yeah, I just wasted $2,500. I got scammed. Of, yeah. You know, because there's also pride. We're like, we don't want to, we lie to ourselves. We want to uh, uh, paint this picture of an entrepreneur. We're perfect. We never make mistakes. And it happens all the time. Yeah. I have an ex-employee who started his own business and he worked for Storm Group for two years. He's seen it all. He's seen all the videos, roofing insights, everything. Leaves my company. First thing he does, signs up for Home Advisor. Two months later, he's like, Dimitri, you were right about Home Advisor. <laughs> do you want to do a story about it? Like, no, I don't want a story about it. I already have done it. If you did not learn it in my house, he started roofing this. First thing he does, I'm like, Come he's, on, he's man. Like, I'm, I'm, he's like, I'm so stupid. Like, I'm dumb. I'm like, yes, you are. <laughs> You uh, you shine a light on the problem, but now you're creating an alternative, mm -hmm. which um, a lot of people will talk about a problem. That's real popular, mm -hmm. right? Whether it's politics, but who's actually getting out there and running for city council to try to make a change at their local level? You're making you're trying to make a change yes, with directory. Can you walk us through? when you decided to do that and then also how it works so that the other contractors who watch that can see a good alternative because be honest like in dallas seo for roofing doesn't work why because home advisor spends 12 million dollars a month wow. for seo in dallas fort worth alone this is the epicenter for hail i tell my guys it's the nfl of the roofing business right you have to be the best to win here it's very very competitive what when did you? When did the idea that you know what I'm not just going to talk about all these other bad lead gens? I'm going to start my own. When did that idea kind of uh, that uh, that Absolutely. that flame kindle in your mind? So back in the day, I actually met Angie from a Angie Hicks, yeah. founder of Angie. I've met Slays. her too. Yeah, I, I love. She's I, awesome. I loved her company. I've been to. Uh, I was selected by Angie's List to go to their conference. I, I believe it was 2015 because of my reputation, my reviews. They have. Uh, service providers like network it's called SPAC pretty much it's a small community like they, they pay for your expenses to go to their conference and they send you service like we were telling Angels List how to do their business like what contractors wanted and stuff and when I went to Angels List changed my life like I loved everything about it I, I was the biggest Angels List fan you could find I recommend it to other contractors if I find something that works I will teach everybody. And of course I was doing it for free. I was sharing, I mean, I was selling roofs in Angel's List. I would I would do, uh, they, they used to have these big deals. 
$6,500 roof, 325 a square. I would run it for seven days and I would sell six roofs and would get 30 more calls because people would not buy direct. But I literally have people swiping their cards and I'm like, somebody just bought $6,500. And there is a fine print, it's 20 squares, like fees would apply. It was crazy to me. I loved it so much. Then my heart was broken when I saw it getting away. And for years I've been studying like because I'm a student, I like to learn. I I was studying Thumbtack. I was studying Porch.com. All these websites. Not, Tackle. Uh, yep. Not not only I was using them, but I was studying who is behind them. How did they start it? Like you know, Thumbtack. Google investing on two rounds in them. It started, I believe, here in Texas by a student uh, college dropout. Like I studied uh, everyone. Like Porch.com. How they were raising money. So before I knew it, I was already in the space. I already knew all the players. I already understood the market. I understood what contractors want, what uh, homeowners want, because I was a contractor myself. And and I was giving them tips and advices. Like, I talked to people Thumbtack. I talked to marketing director of Porch. I'm like, guys, why don't you do this? Why you do this? So not only I was recognized by them, but I was giving them this feedback. And, and then I realized, you know what? Why don't I do it? Like, I... Like, and I took Angel's List as number one model. And Angel's List was not perfect, but I'm like, it's close enough. And I'm like, how much money do I need to build it? And the cost was like quarter million dollars to build a website. And uh, our website built on the same platform as Instagram. So it's it's all code. It's not your WordPress, like how you would build a roofing uh, site. So I needed a lot of money. It took me two years to get ready for it. Everybody knew it's coming. Like I told my friends, when I started teaching, I'm like, you know what? That's my end goal. If I do one more business, this is my last business. I, I want to have tech company that connects homeowners and contractors. I start brainstorming. So first I build Roofing Insights. I build my network. I become influencer, start raising more and more money. But I paid myself the same amount as I paid myself like a year ago. It's like, I don't need more money. I believe nobody needs more than 200,000 a year. Like I have five kids. I live in a nice house, like 200,000 a year. It's amazing lifestyle. Like I don't need to make half a million. I've seen those Sunday <laughs> dinners. <laughs> Well, I, I'm, I'm saying like you, you can live a very good you life. You, like, so I'm not a money driven person. I don't need a million dollars a year, but I wanted to build a legacy and I want to do what I'm most passionate about. I'm like, I'm just going to do it. And I found my partners are overseas because uh, my dollar uh, buys what home advisors $10 buy. Yes. Like I have to be smart. I do like, I believe in influencers uh influencing marketing uh but the thing is i want to build a product that influencers will want to talk about if home advisor comes to youtuber to contractor youtuber i don't think people will the contractors will endorse it without ruining their reputation i build directory will people swear by it like i used to swear about angels list wow. and i don't want like if roofers feel like it's a good product, good service. And th that's why it's not a lead generation business. It's a, ser a search base. If you type in roofing in your zip code, the first result will be who is closer to you right now. Later, we'll have reviews and some other algorithms. But right now, it's not pay to play. Everybody shows uh, closest contractor show first. And the biggest thing for me is here's what I didn't understand. Why companies like BBB and Home Advisor don't guarantee their work? They, they, they make you this promise, like we have the best contractors. But when those contractors steal from you, takes the check and run away, or don't finish the job, there's a fine print, like hire you know, responsibly. We're not liable for anything. They're not liable for leads to the contractor. They're not liable to the homeowner. Why do we need? Yeah. Like if I if I get an Uber, no right? skin in the game. Exactly. So when you get a package from Amazon, if it's broken, whatever, you send it back. Amazon will fulfill that order. We'll deal with it. That's why we'll have Amazon. If Uber driver is not professional or whatever, Uber will deal. With. Uber literally have a police within Uber who investigates sexual assaults, like all in, in behavior. That's why when you get Uber, you feel safe just like a taxi, right? You know, because they are they are middlemen, but they have a skin in the game and they do it really well. Some accountability. 
So what does BBB does? What does Home Advisor does? They'll send you the ch- and by literally shadiest contractors, brand new who've never been in the business before, like started a company yesterday because those suckers need leads and they're easy targets for them. So who is in the Home Advisor? It's not your local leaders. It's not the biggest companies. It's your startups. Are they the best option? No, they're not. So I I wanted to change it. And I wanted my word to mean something. And this is what's crazy. And my lawyer tried to talk me out of it. And he's like, why do you want to do a $20,000 guarantee? Because I want my word to mean something. And I think it's my best advertising. I want that claim. I want that liability. As crazy as it sounds, I want a contractor in directory to fail. So the world will see that I will back him up. 20K is big. Uh, There's a guy here. I think he's branched out to a couple of neighboring states who do it's called the good contractors like 10, list. 10,000 or something. And his is 10, yeah. Uh John Phillips is is his name, I believe. The other crazy thing about at least Home Advisor does a background check of a managing or ownership member. You B- got to give B- them B- that. B- BS. But yeah, they but don't do BBB does not there are people on the BBB. Home Advisor will run the BBB. We actually recorded a phone call with the owner. She called us and she said she told Home Advisor rap that he has a felony. And he's like, well, we'll just run a background check on your wife. Yeah. And he was so smooth. Oh, like I've he, heard that too. Yeah. It's crazy. On the BBB, if uh, you could have a f- felony for like sexual assault mm-hmm. and you will be an A plus if you pay your thousand or your two thousand. We, we do we do full background check. It costs us about a hundred dollars. Uh, and as a matter of fact, every week I have five, six calls of guys who did not pass it. Mm. So my thing is I'm a guy of second chances. And so far we d- only did not approve two. Like for example, I'll give you one example one of the guys called uh did not pass the check it was sexual assault or like he literally went to the police uh no not sexual assault it was um uh how do you call it home uh, violence uh, yeah domestic violence D- domestic maybe? violence yeah. domestic violence so i like for me that was big and i j- all i want is to hear the story i'm okay letting someone in if i know the story i have drug dealer guys like who resist and arrest but if something happened seven years ago and you've been sober for seven years like why wouldn't like you run your business you change your life who am i to judge you but i want to know but now if you have a drug possession within the last six months i probably will give you a couple more years so there's a big difference sure as long as you know the story you can make the decision but i remember this guy calls me and four years ago (laughs) he had a domestic violence charge i'm like ah this is not good so i'm like tell me the story he's like well I was drinking a lot and I came home and the sexual was my girlfriend at the time. Now she's my wife. We're married later. <laughs> and she did not want me to go out and she hid my wallet and I still wanted to leave and I was drinking and she called the police and whatever. So he was drunk. He actually was sober ever since. He never drank again. Wow. He he married that woman after the fact. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, what a story. No doubt. But But you have a domestic violence on your record Again, if it happens last six months, you know, different story. Maybe it will give you a little bit more time to recover or whatever. So we are a company of second chances. Uh, I do have felons on directory. But uh, if people call me and say, Dimitri, did you know that this guy is felon? I'm going to be prepared. Yes, I knew. And uh, another funny story. We have another guy. Um, (laughs) We did not run a background check. I did interview with him on a channel. And uh, we have uh, someone reaching out. I was like, you're doing interviews with people. Do you do background check on them? This guy is a felon. I'm like, he's a felon. What did he do? He was, uh, <laughs> she told me. And then we reached out to the person. He's like, yep, that's true. He was impersonated police officer oh, to seduce women. <laughs> I'm like, dude, you have to teach my audience how to do that. That's like <laughs> the coolest thing I've heard. <laughs> that might be your best ranking video of all time. <laughs> <laughs> if, I know, right? He did. I've got a how-to video on how to get <laughs> chicks by pretending to be a cop. That's uh, that would be amazing. That would break your YouTube channel, man. I know, right? <laughs> you might pass Roger Wakefield. I mean, seriously. How? Wh- what get? What was the? What was the impetus for starting the YouTube channel? You just you. Um, you're it was a- cheapest marketing. I did not really. Have, uh, when I started the roofing company, uh, I did my research, and I see everybody was saying like, do organic content. I'm I'm a big on content marketing, and uh, I follow guys like Gary V and a few other YouTubers, and uh, I wanted to advertise. I didn't have money for TV. 
or radio. I'm like, I'm going to be my own TV or radio. So at first, and as a matter of fact, I thought my English was so bad. Uh, I did not, I was embarrassed to talk. So my first video was like drone videos and just typical stuff. Like I would do top 15 colors by GF and I would film them and I would put like literal video like that. My first talking video with my seven year old girl, uh, girl daughter, uh, Anastasia, how to choose a roofing color. I m m have her memorize the script and she was teaching how to choose a roofing color. It cool. was the video. And then uh, my, um, at the time, six-year-old son did like how to video. Like, so I put my kids on camera because I did not feel confident to to speak. I thought people will laugh at me. And, so, and then I'm like, I can't do it no more. I can't abuse my kids. And I start talking <laughs> to myself. Yeah. No, that's uh, the content game. Um, everybody wants to be in it, right? But the consistency is something that if you don't have much to say, you kind of run out of ins inspirational things to say to have to pretty quickly. Going. Well, it's, for me, it's answering questions. People ask you questions all the time. Just answer them in the video. Like, you go to the homeowner today, they ask you a question, come home, record answer to that question, because in the future, most likely you will get it uh, asked again. Sure. So you already have something in the library answering it. Why not? Yeah. Um, have the haters come out of the woodwork? You know, oh, people who... who... Ha haters are always going to be there. Like 95% 95, 95 likes... Five percent dislikes for me, it's it's a win. Like if you if you can manage ten percent dislikes, like I I get haters on on the videos that it's not about me. I would interview someone. Like someone is so nice, so cool. And when I see dislikes and comments on it, I'm like, really? You're gonna hate that video? I'll give you an example. Just recently, um, Adam Sand came to uh, my interview and I asked him question about. Uh, drug problem in the industry what do we can do about it because it's epidemic we have you know guys dying and you know a lot of alcoholics what's what's not and he gave like the most freaking amazing answer and so many people comments like man i needed to hear it today blah blah and i have a hate comments like why don't you focus on something positive why make videos like that and i'm like well you know what? You have a scroll. Like scroll down. If you if I don't want to watch a video about topic, you vote with your thumbs. Just go to the next video. Yeah. But the very next day, I got a news the guy di died from overdose in Chicago. Damn. And we Ben Minchaka used to work with him, so he knew it. And Ben Minchaka told me about it. And I remember I'm in the airport, like heartbroken. And I, I just remember I was arguing with that idiot who just commented yesterday, don't make videos like that. And I went live and I said, you know what? Never tell a creator what content to create because you never know who needs to hear it. I don't know who needs to hear this story. Like, I don't like if I like I never turn on the camera if I don't have a message and a title. My advice would be to creators. You don't have a clear title, like a movie title. Don't even start the camera. But if you have a clear message, someone needs to hear it, record it, stop thinking about it. Just do it. And that's what I do. Like so often I would start a live video and say, I don't know who needs to hear it. If there's one person needs to hear this message, I'm going to share. That's it. Stop hating. Never tell creator what videos to make. I mean, you, you say it by comments by likes by your engagement with the video but it, it just drives me crazy how many people are hating because it's easy yeah oh yeah hating is absolutely easy how did you get much backlash for the lc nuspec interview uh, uh, especially since a lot of it, us in the insurance it's controversial but uh, I, I i actually was surprised of positive feedback really i, I feel like what lc did he opened up first of all his character he's very smart I don't think he's shady. Like I would rather do business with someone like LC than a few other guys in the industry who is all like nice and polished, but in reality will stop you in the back. I, I feel like guys like LC, you can trust them. Uh, did he create the best product for the industry? No, but at least you heard his perspective. You have to give him credit for doing two and a half hour interview answering honest questions how much you you have no idea how many people will not even do interview with you yeah. like I, I have a blooms family uh, uh, uh greg bloom vice president of um beacon company and his wife uh she beacon the supplier beacon the supplier and uh jill bloom she runs roofing contractor magazine they wouldn't even do interview they Why? would 
because they don't want to be asked serious questions. Yeah. That, that's the thing. So you have you have your white people, you all like, you know, industry leaders who who want to help contractor who will not even be on camera, ask questions. And you have guys like Elsie Nasbeck, who is already controversial, who is already getting tons of tons. hate. And he still goes out hey, and shares his story. Brought you into his house. Exactly. Right? And, and invites you, opens up. So I would rather do business with Elsie Nasbeck than Bloom's family. Yeah. Someone <laughs> who's the same here as they are out there. Um, you, I know you're you're a big basketball guy, so you understand the the te- the the power of teamwork, of course. And nothing forges that in the in the mind of a young person more than sports. That's why I believe they're really really important. It's almost a prereq for anyone who comes into our company that they played a team sport oh, really? or still play one because there's something to be said for winning together and losing together, like last night, right? It was. Uh, I'm from Washington, so I was rooting hard for Gonzaga. But man, Baylor was the better team, like through and through. You missed it. You were asleep. Yep. Oh, that sucks. It was a crazy game. They, they Baylor, Baylor won from from the jump. They were ahead by 20 points within oh, wow. five, within five minutes. Um, when you're recruiting people, or when you were, because I know you're out of the actual roofing contracting mm-hmm. business now to. Mostly because of the lead gen thing, right? You didn't want there to be a conflict it, it, yeah, of interest. Yeah, it, it was a big conflict. Nobody gonna tr- uh, trust yeah. the lead gen guy if you still uh, have a contract. I, I kind of think it's the same for these CRM guys. Yes, they're contractors, but they're trying to sell a, a CRM too. And you're True. just like, this isn't. I don't doesn't completely work. trust you, man. Yeah, if I want to open a branch in your city, I don't know if you're gonna try to try to bust me down. Um, how important is culture? Culture is a buzzword oh. in our in our business. There's these there's companies that put together mission statements and all, and that's awesome. They have core values, um, but really, when the rubber meets the road, they're out waving deductibles. They're not replacing drip edge where they should. You know, you know the little shit. You it, see it all the it, time. It, it starts from the top. Um, if I would give advice to business owners out there, it would be: don't hold on to your rock stars. Like I see it too many times, just like in the basketball teams, you know, you have your LeBrons. I mean, superstars, right? But what I like about Golden Warriors, they did not have that one star. Like at any, it, it was all always crazy to watch who's gonna pick it up this game. You have five players who can score mm-hmm. thirty points plus, and and that's why they were good for so long. But uh, the reason I think it's because they have a star coach, and it was just a better team, better company. We call it a company for a reason. And I, what I see a lot happening in the industry, and it's still not going away, top producers hold, uh, hold business owners as a hostages. Yeah. And and uh, I'm a big fan of Rodney Webb, and Rodney Webb have hired, fired a lot of those top producers, and I do too. Like oftentimes when people used to apply for work for me, they would sit and you feel that arrogance and be like, oh, I've sold $3 million. I don't want your $3 million. I want, and I, I do want a sales, but not at all cost. I, during the interview, I always ask myself one question, one question only about sales guys. Would I buy from this person? Mm. If the answer is no, I don't give a crap about his numbers. If I feel like I would not buy from you, why would I hire you to sell my product? Can you sell $3 million for me? Yes. But I guarantee you, if I would not buy from you, it means our values are not aligned. And you have a lot of guys like that. They're arrogant. And also, guys who have been in the game for a long time, they're the worst because they know their value. They feel like they're overrated. They truly are. And uh, just because you sold $4 million last year does not mean that you're going to do it this year. And they start demanding this crazy demands like, I want a truck. I want this. I want that. And it kills the culture. And those guys, I would rather have five guys who sell a million than two guys who sells two and a half, but competing with each other. Like I always went for guys who follow the process. As a matter of fact, uh, the youngest guy in my company, he was 26. When we adopted the Rodney Web, he was the best at the Rodney Web system, the best. So he was the youngest sales rep, but he was the best at the Rodney So he followed the process and I made him a sales manager. Man, everybody followed the guy. Nobody cares about his age. You want to promote guys who follow your company uh, structure and the process. And 
superstars usually neglect press. Like, I have my thing. I don't need you. I don't need your Shortcuts. system. Well, yeah. you don't need them. You need people because if you want to build a McDonald's, you have to follow the system that McDonald's follows. You, you, you know, if you were number one employee at Burger King, come to McDonald's with your own stuff. Like, they don't give a crap. They're McDonald's. So I always um, endorse people who follow my process because that's scalable. You know, superstars are not scalable. LeBron, LeBron's, they come and they go. But if you have like Golden State Warriors, you know, they might lose one or two good players. But overall, they're not going to suffer that much. Yeah, absolutely. Um, do you think there's a, a real fallacy in quantity over quality? Like a lot of guys are always asking me, like, how do I recruit more guys? How do I get more guys? All And, and that is actually tougher than people understand actually mm -hmm. getting someone who's qualified in who gets all the way through your interview process whatever that process is um number one how did you recruit and then number two were you a, a firm believer i think you just kind of touched on it in that quality over quantity type deal it's quality over quantity like i'm a brand builder so for me i started with the leads i never door and knock so if you build your brand organically 20 30 year percent every year I only need one or two more guys every year. So for me, I recruit talent everywhere I go. Like um, a couple of weeks ago, I was at DMV and I see this kid like hustling. And he's like, I literally look at my phone, how much people at DMV make? Like how much do they make? It's like 38,000 Google told me. Mm. I'm like, shit. I'm like, do you like what you do here? He was there for eight months. Like uh, Amber, my assistant roofing inside, she was working at a hotel for three years. Uh, we were doing class and she was best employee I ever mm. have, year and a half. She was a receptionist at a hotel. And when I look at her, I actually told guys at the class, I'm like, that girl will work for me. And I sneaked out after the class and I gave her a card. Like two months later, I took her for an interview. And the rest is history. For like, she, According to her, she has the best job she ever had. She is a hustler. That girl, like she understood customer service. She was so good. She was working nine shifts, night shifts at a hotel, and making like fifty-five thousand a year. I, I knew I could offer more, and I knew she will be successful. Uh, I hired um, my Wells Fargo teller, the same girl I've seen uh, her for really? for years, like for for roofing company. One day, and you have to be careful because I'm a guy. She's a girl. Like you know, you don't want to look like a guy who's just hitting it. Right. Uh, but at the same time, ask her out for lunch. She said, I have a, like one day, just nobody was looking. Like, I have a job offer for you. And uh, and I remember, um, you know, we did the interview and everything. Two weeks later, she said, yes, she'll come work for us. And I asked her, why did you say yes? <laughs> First answer was, like, I've seen your bank account, which was, she was my teller. <laughs> and I didn't even, I didn't even yeah, click. Yeah, yeah. But second, she said, uh, I Googled the company and it was all good reviews. And I tell people all the time, uh, if you build your brand, you're not only building brand for your potential customers, those online reviews no longer for your new customers, for new employees. I have, w when we have a hail in Minneapolis, I have five, six calls every summer. People are like, are you guys hiring? Where are you from? Colorado. I see numbers from out of state. But people before, uh, sales guys are smarter now. Oh, yeah. Everybody wants to work with the, uh, for business with the five-star Google reviews because they know if you have one-star Google rating. Hard to sell. It's hard to sell. Yep. So the, if you are the biggest player in town, you become magnet not only for customers but also for employees. Just like roofers don't have a problem with the subs. They come to you. Yeah. Well, when you have a solid brand, I'm telling you, it's easier to recruit, especially if you have a good reputation that you pay on time, you have a good training system, and you're known for it. Word spreads fast. Yeah. You do something right, people will follow. You, uh, you're you recruiting people in person, but w did you also use uh, some tech, like Indeed, ZipRecruiter, things yeah, like that? We have it right now. Indeed, like uh, th this time around, it's very hard because we have labor shortage everywhere. Yeah. Like Roofing Insights hiring right now, I have three ads. I mean, for uh, I still uh, have the most success on Craigslist for like uh, gig uh, jobs like videographers ah. still a craigslist we just hired full-time third videographer yesterday he starts monday it oh. was craigslist but um yeah you, you never know yeah 
uh, it's uh, it's a challenge, right? Getting the, getting people in. Um, my my shortcoming is uh, I've got this real head coach. I think I can coach you up. Like I meet you, maybe you maybe you aren't thorough. Maybe you don't follow up. Maybe you are uh, not the most eloquent. But I think I can get you there. So to to defeat that in me, because I'm an, an eternal optimist, right? It's all I'm always looking at the bright side. I have them meet with two other members of the company before they get to meet with me. Mm-hmm. And we get opin- those opinions play a big role in whether I even meet this person. Because if I just recruited and hired everyone who I met. Um, we did the same thing. I don't know if I'd have. Yeah. So it's a it's, it's a weird deal when you're the kind of the leader. Um, you got to you got to have a handle on reality. Um, and I, I'm always looking at, looking for the silver lining. And I think staying positive is really important, but reality, uh, you know, the bottom line is all about reality. It's not about the dream. It's not about what could be or anything like that. So people watching this want to reach out to you. Um, how can, how can they know you're easy to find on YouTube and then how uh, can contractors get connected to directory and how's it spelled? Sure. Uh, it's double eyes because I'm Russian. I can't spell now. <laughs> I, I wanted to create a new word that means something. If you think about Google, like you, you want to create a new word, new meaning, like Amazon has a new meaning now. Directory was self-descriptive, but with why it was taken. And I actually really like how it looks with the eyes. Yeah, it I looks think great. It, it memorable. You, once you see it, you cannot unsee it. You know, it's... Uh, so it's directory.com. If anybody wants to apply, you just go to directory.com and the light, uh, right corner says list your business. Um, it costs five hundred dollars per year to apply. It includes uh, we're gonna build a landing page for you. We'll take a picture, stuff like that. We'll do a full background check. If you don't qualify for any reasons, you don't pay. And then it's a three percent on transaction. So you know people find you, and you don't get like we don't sell you leads once people connect with you like and right now it's free like three uh, percent is coming later so people give being have been getting jobs I actually call is like can i pay you like no would you say you're in beta right now or it's it's live and it's growing? live it's working we, we okay. have we actually have uh 16 leads last month we we didn't have a contractor for like so people call us and we're in different parts of the country y- yep just didn't have anybody to even recommend uh, cities like dallas chicago dallas actually closed for roofing contractors we're only targeting top one percent so for example if you have three thousand contractors we're not going to allow more than 30 in directory and once we have 30 it's closed mm-hmm. unless we have a problem with them we'll do a wait list and we'll replace someone who we kicked out or not just the roofing category, right? Yeah, yeah. Roofing, a, gutters, siding. Plumbers, yeah. like electrician, HVACs. We're going to have all the 100 categories, but uh, people sign up and you know we'll list them. You still can advertise $20,000 guarantee. We will do $20,000 guarantee even on your own jobs, so it doesn't have to come through a director. This is the craziest part of what people don't understand. Uh I'm not going to try to find a way like, well, but they didn't find you here, so you're on your own. As a matter of fact, if you're listed in directory and you do your own job and people call us, say, hey, I've been sold this $20,000 guarantee, I actually want to know. Because if you're messing up someone outside of directory, it's still my liability. It's still one more reason to kick you out from directory. Right. Like, I want that call. So you can advertise it to your advantage. You can put the badge in your truck and you say, hey, and it's legit. People can call us. I'll sell you. if you dec- As a matter of fact, recently uh, I've, uh, in Chicago, uh, we have a lot of Polish guys. And a lot of them are in our directory because it's, you know, I used to live in Chicago, just a really big community. I have a couple Polish guys calling me from Chicago when they are in houses there's also half a million Russians live in Chicago. And it's mm. like, Dmitry, this, this guy is Russian. Can you translate? I literally <laughs> provide translation to them. So I would- the Personal touch. Uh, personal touch. So if you're a director and anybody needs a Russian translator- That's clutch, man. Uh, we, we, we will definitely talk to your Russian clients. <laughs> Plus, you're still you're still at your very core a salesman. So you gotta, you gotta fill that. I'm still a contractor. Yeah. I've been a contractor for over 10 years. So. That's awesome, man. Um, how did the arm wrestling deal with Ryan Uch, how did that, how did that originate? He just challenged you and said, yeah, I, everybody I could crush you me. in an yeah, arm much, wrestling deal. Much. Did your, is your elbow cool? Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, do you hey, want to arm wrestle? No, you, you win. 
I appreciate you coming on, man. I really Absolutely. do. It's good to meet you in person. Thanks, Thanks. for having me. Absolutely. Thanks, brother. Appreciate that was awesome. You. Yeah, man. Thanks a bunch. We're going to run now. That was great. Dimitri's such a good guy. I know that came across. Um, that was a very... Uh, that was a very heartwarming podcast, and uh, what an inspiring guy. Uh, you know, guy like that, going through what he's gone through, none of us have excuses. Got to do more. Do our best today. Hey, I'd love to know what you think about these podcasts, so if you want to drop a comment below, bring it on. If you want to reach out to me on uh, Instagram, you can do that at Jess from the Northwest, or if you want to work together, email me anytime, live at autographconstruction.com, and I'll see you next time. <laughs>